Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Roberto Alvarez. I'm the executive director of the GFCC. The GFCC is a global multi-stakeholder organization. We have members that are corporations, government agencies, universities, and private sector councils, industry chambers, and alike. Combining our members and fellows, we have a footprint in more than 30 countries, and it's a pleasure to have you here today with us. We're here for another one of our online sessions. This is Building Compact Evidence, a dialogue series that we have launched and initiated roughly a month ago in partnership with the Delphi Economic Forum and the Council on Competitiveness of Greece. This whole process that will include four online discussions is leading us to the GFCC Global Innovation Summit on November from the 14th to the 17th in Athens, Greece, in partnership with the Council of Competitiveness of Greece and the Delphi Economic Forum. On this second edition of our Building Competitiveness series, we're talking place-based innovation, the nexus connecting regions, assets on the ground with global competitiveness. We have an amazing group of people. I will introduce them to you shortly. But what I wanted to do now, it's really invite all of you to be part of the conversation we will try to pull some questions from our audience. So feel free to jump into the chat, to jump into the Q&A part of our platform here and share your thoughts and questions. To get us started, I really wanted to invite our hosts, Deborah Wentz-Smith and Simos Anastasopoulos to out welcome you all and make some framing remarks. Deborah is the founder and president of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils, the GFCC. She also is the president and CEO of the Councilman Competitiveness in the United States and had an amazing career working at the White House, the Commerce Department in the United States, where she was the first assistant secretary for technology to be uh, approved by uh, the Congress and the Senate in the United States. Simos Anastasopoulos is the founder and president of the Council on Competitiveness of Greece, an amazing partner of the GFCC. He is the CEO of Pitsavias. He has played a variety of roles in weaving the, I would say, competitiveness institutional framework in Greece. Until recently, he was the president of the Hellenic American Chamber. So Deborah, why don't I turn to you for your initial remarks and uh, then we see most and then we can uh, welcome and start our panel conversation. Thank you, Roberto. And, and let me second your welcome to our very distinguished group of speakers today and all of those who are with us um, from around the world. I thought I'd just make a few uh, comments and then turn it over to my partner and dear friend, uh, Simos Anastanopoulos. We're very excited about bringing the GFCC to Athens, Greece in November. We're gonna have an incredible program. And of course the theme from local to global really gets anchored in place-based innovation. And let me just start by saying that this is not a new topic. It's always been part of human development from the time we started creating complex civilizations the different cities, different regions develop capabilities and assets, competitive advantages in production and products and trade. But today it's become more important than ever because in a very tightly knit complex global economy, we still need to ensure that regions, cities, countries have the capability inside their, their borders as it were, and their partners and regions to develop high value goods and provide jobs and services to their people um, to ensure prosperity and security. So I'll say that in the case of the US Council on Competitiveness, because we, we're very proud that we played a tremendous thought leadership role in the whole development of the concepts of regional clusters, cluster mapping. We did this work really in the, night, in the late 90s in partnership with our board members, uh, Michael Porter at Harvard and many others. And the first studies we did really captured the transformation of regions in the United States. I'll just share 
two examples. One, San Diego. San Diego is, of course, a great place to live and a climate and people love to be there, but it has always been a very important center for the U.S. Navy, and it was really considered a Navy port. But back in the 1990s, it started to transform, and today it is a center of wireless communications grounded in Qualcomm, biotech with Scripps, many, many other, and it, the Navy's part of it, but it's now really part of the global economy with creating a very, very high value economy for the region. Another area, a country or, or city I wanna highlight since we have the mayor of Tricola with us is Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio became the epicenter in the United States for glass manufacturing. The glass that was produced uh, by and used in all the vehicles in World War II, all of that came from Toledo. Fast forward, Toledo and the University of Toledo is a place that developed the whole technology for flat panel displays and solar panels today. And this is an ex these are two examples of taking assets and capabilities and building competitive economies and the high standard of living for citizens. The US Council on Competitiveness has worked for many years with our government, the uh, Department of Commerce Economic Development Association. We've done toolkits on how to develop you know, place-based innovation. But today, as part of our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers, we are turbocharging this and we're going to be focused on those regions of the United States that need to be brought into the innovation economy, not just having our great centers in Silicon Valley and Boston and Austin and Chicago, et cetera, but to really build out place-based innovation with inclusivity and diversity for everyone in the United States. And so this is a very exciting topic for the uh, GFCC meeting in November. We're gonna learn, we're gonna share best practices, and I know we're gonna create on the ground some new strategic partnerships for all of us to benefit from moving out on place-based innovation. Thank you so much, Deborah. Simos, over to you. You are muted as we normally yes. are. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Roberto, and uh, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Roberto, for your kind uh, introduction. You are known to exaggerate a lot and, uh, uh, regarding especially my role in uh, trying to, to reform the country and introduce innovation. We are very proud to participate in uh, this dialogue. And of course, we are even prouder to host, uh, along with uh, our very good friends at Delphi Economic Forum, this year's uh, Innovation Summit. It will be a great event for Greece. It will be a great opportunity for us to showcase the efforts and the developments that, uh, and the progress that our country has done in reforming its economy to move from a traditional economy to a new one that is going to be based on extroversion and innovation. And uh, also talk about all the advancements that have happened in uh, Greece in uh, these last years. Uh, it is also a great honor to participate in this series, especially today with uh, two great leaders, uh, Mr. Khasri and Mr. Vishwas from uh, Malaysia and uh, Texas. But it is a great pleasure also to introduce very good friends to people that are, uh, have really driven, and I'm not exaggerating here, uh, have really driven innovation and uh, the startup community in, uh, the, Greek, uh, in the Greek things. Uh, we have uh, cooperated with uh, Mayor Papastergiou and, of course, with Professor Dukidis several times. And uh, it is uh, to no uh, less extent that uh, uh, Mayor Pap uh, Papastergiou has been the bright example of what can happen in a traditional Greek city, small to medium size, a, a city that was not particularly industrialized, with not particular touristic uh, importance. Uh, and he has really managed this last year to make a bright example of uh, the city. He has uh, the digitalization of the city. The introduction of innovation there has benefited the people, first of all, has made their life easier, has been, uh, uh, as I said, an example to attract uh, investment in the country, and uh, has really been the, the driving force in uh, the whole community of uh, regions and uh, uh, other cities in, in uh, the Greek country. It will be very important to listen from uh, Mr. Papastergiou because it's really the materialization, the real example of uh, what uh, local innovation means and how it can affect the whole country. Now, to talk about Professor Dukidis, it must be, of course, uh, very little. Professor Dukidis almost single-handedly 
has uh, driven the innovation and startup scene in, uh, in Greece these last years. Uh, he has uh, been a driving force for the government, for the universities. He has driven the collaboration of academia with the uh, industry. And it has been a real pleasure to cooperate with him, not only because he's an expert in his field, but with his open mind, he has assisted. Uh, he has acted as a real leader, helping uh, the Chamber of Commerce that I was uh, leading before, as well as uh, the Council of uh, Competitiveness today, to try to persuade governments, uh, the authorities, the public administration to reform the country to uh, improve competitiveness. So I have no other words than to uh, welcome both of them, to thank them for their uh, collaboration all these uh, years, and uh, listen with the rest of you to what they have to say about Greece today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Sima, so much again for the partnership and for uh, this introduction. We have four amazing speakers. You have already um, heard about them. I'll briefly comment and, and introduce them. We have Dr. Sorab Biswas, who is the Executive Director of Commercialization and Entrepreneurship at Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station. Great to have you here, Sorab. Sorab has founded five tech companies. He has been a board member and investor in several companies. Um, he works at the Department of Biomedical Engineering today and oversees the whole IP portfolio. Very importantly, Texas A&M, for sure, based out of Texas, has operations in different countries, including Qatar and France. We'll be back to that. Professor Georgis Dukidis from the University of Athens. We, we already talked about Professor Dukidis, a, a driver, a driving force for entrepreneurship in Greece, but not just there. He got a PhD in AI from the London School of Economics and has worked um, uh, in that field and, and taught at the LSE uh, in the past. He was the first chairman of the Greek New Economy Fund of Funds, uh, driving supporting investments in new ventures. And he is now the board member of the Hellenic Authority of Higher Education in the Hellenic Development Bank. Mayor Papasteriou, Dimitris Papasteriou is the immediate of city of Trikala, which I understand mayor has around 80,000 inhabitants, is the first smart city, top one in Greece, one of the 21 first top cities, smart cities in the globe today, recognized as that. Um, he studied electrical engineering and computer um, engineer, which I think give you a competitive edge into its smart cities. Um, he was first elected in 2014, re-elected in 2019, and we will hear from him about the things that he has been driving in Trikala. And joining us from Malaysia late night there, we have Hazri Hassan, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Northern Corridor and Implementation Authority, which uh, comprises or covers four states in Malaysia. When we had the GFCC Global Innovation Summit in 2017, we had a chance to visit the Northern Corridor Implementation Authority and uh, know more about what's being done on the ground there. For many of us who have been working on innovation, entrepreneurship, economic development, Malaysia, it's a super relevant case. The Penang region and the region covered by the authority is where, where many of Western companies, semiconductor companies, microelectronic companies have settled during the 90s and the 2000s. And Hasri has been driving an agenda to advance economic growth in the region. Mayor, I wanted to start with you. So what is the secret to advance innovation on the ground? What have you been doing and how can we do that? What, what could you tell our global audience here today? It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Roberto, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thank you uh, also for all the good uh, words. I think that you're overstating uh, somehow, but let's see how we had uh, uh, to handle the situation. Uh, I was uh, elected for the first time about eight years back, exactly in the middle of the economic crisis of Greece. And uh, our citizens were waiting to bring uh, innovation, to bring something new, to tell something new. Uh, our first thoughts were, who could help us? Who could bring growth and development to our local society? But it is a matter of fact that nobody knows better 
uh, are regions than us. So we had to make a SWOT analysis uh, somehow of our city, of our municipality, which is, as, uh, as you said, uh, a rather small or medium-sized municipality in the center of uh, the mainland of, uh, of Greece, and to see mainly our advantages. Uh, those ones were, for sure, a very open-minded community. The second one was a very passionate team. And uh, those two, two uh, things, I think, are the uh, most valuable to start uh, working. We saw, for example, that there, were, uh, there was a gap with, uh, as far as uh, the digital transformation of municipalities of Greece. And there uh, was in front of us a huge opportunity, uh, which was the first trial, the first project of driverless buses in Europe. And that was exactly uh, the, the point that uh, we really needed. We start discussing with the local community about uh, the fears, but also about uh, the positive uh, issues that uh, could uh, become from this project. Uh, we started uh, working on that, and uh, for six months, our project was for sure uh, the best practice of Europe as far as the driverless buses. It was also the first time that uh, Europe uh, made laws about uh, cars without drivers. That was a very interesting point when some people, being afraid of our project, were sending us email telling that uh, my mayor, okay, this is very interesting, but a lot of drivers will lose their jobs. Uh, but uh, I was answered to these emails that you have totally right, but please don't send emails because some postmen will lose their jobs also. So I was saying that uh, nobody can stop uh, uh, technology can stop, uh, go ahead. Uh, there, I also noticed something very interesting for our uh, conversation, for our discussion today, that I see that, uh, I saw that there was a gap between the local authorities or the state and the citizens, because we all had as a local authority something in mind, but citizens had other uh, anxieties, other fears. And there was a gap between the local authorities and the citizens. And uh, this gap sometimes, uh, nowadays, I think that is getting filled with extreme voices and extreme uh, op opinions. Uh, this is the point that we have uh, to pay attention. We have to be there and discuss, discuss with the local authorities. Listen to them, listen to what they need, what they feel about local development and growth, and try to be with them to make them engaged with our vision. For sure, there must be a vision, but then the next step is to persuade them to follow our vision. Uh, and the other thing I think that we all have to do is to write down, uh, as I told you, uh, the advantages of our regions. For example, my region, Trikala, is the first uh, region, the first municipality of Greece uh, in a bottling Tsipuro, a, a local drink. It's also the first uh, municipality in um, uh, feta cheese. All these things uh, make uh, our uh, region have a lot of interest. Uh, we are also exactly, as I told you, in the center of Greece. About 10 years ago, we started uh, organizing a very big Christmas event. We saw that there was uh, no Christmas event in Greece. We organized the Mill of Fields, which is now the biggest thematic park of Greece, uh, having more than a million of visitors uh, for these 40 days during the Christmas uh, holidays. Those are some small, uh, let's say, uh, secrets about how we can transform our municipalities. Uh, for sure, as an engineer, as an electric engineer, I prefer uh, going from the problem to the solution, having reverse engineering, and somewhere there I see, and I believe, are the solutions for the local growth and the local development. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I think this was very inspiring. And one key takeaway that I take from your comments is about knowing the assets that you have. I think that you mentioned that doing SWOT analysis, but also understanding what are the advantages that the region already has. So having a clear understanding um, about that. Um, we will have a chance to talk, to explore a bit about the progress and initiatives that you have implemented. But I also wanted to take note about something else that I had I had read about you, you just mentioned, the, uh, the need to create dialogue platforms, really society-wide. Well, I think it's that you mentioned we, we're living in a time 
when political divide, it's a critical issue to be addressed. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, Hasri, I want to turn to you. The whole region there that is covered by the Northern Corridor Implementation Authority, if I'm not wrong, has almost 2 million inhabitants, right? Probably 1.8 or, or 1.9. And I think as many of us coming from different parts of the globe have read and, and learn about the success of Malaysia in attracting investments in semiconductors and electronics in the 90s and the 2000s. And the whole agency was created in the Northern Corridor uh, effort to, to further advance the economy. So how are you doing that on the ground? I think I remember when you and I had a prep call and you touched upon something that the mayor had, has mentioned here where I think it's critical how you how how you can close the gap, including the gap on skills. So how are you doing that on the ground? Yeah, thank you, uh, Roberto, uh, Deborah, and the GFCC for inviting me to, to this conversation and uh, fellow speakers. Okay, uh, first I would like to just uh, explain to you uh, Malaysia, the Malaysian government uh, embarked on the initiative of regional development uh, back in 2007 or 2008. So it has been about 15 years when you know, we have actually embarked on this uh, regional development approach. Uh, five regional corridors was, was established, one in the northern region, uh, one in the southern eastern region, and also two in East Malaysia. So the idea was uh, because of uh, there was an imbalance in terms of development. Uh, yes, uh, there, there, there was a disparity in terms of economic growth compared to the central region where all the, uh, the investments, the, the economic activities are concentrated in. So uh, also uh, another thing is, uh, they, they, they actually each region has a very unique value proposition and capabilities. So the regional corridors was established to uplift the uh, capabilities and also generate economic growth uh, in each of the corridor. So the Northern Corridor Economic Region actually comprises of four states in the Northern Region. Uh, we actually have about 6.8 million people uh, living here. Yeah, four states uh, covering about 32,000 kilometers uh, squared. Yeah. So the Northern Corridor Implementation Authority or NCIA, where I'm represent, uh, representing, uh, basically we, we, we want to drive economic development. Uh, we promote uh, investments. Uh, and also we implement uh, strategic projects and program in, in order to accelerate the development uh, of the Northern region. So one of the things that I would like to share uh, tonight or this evening uh, is basically how uh, we approach uh, in terms of generating the economic activities and increasing the capability of the region. Uh, number one, we focus on uh, empowering the human capital we look at into uh, people's uh, skills, the uh, capability, and also entrepreneurship. And secondly, we implement uh, key strategic infrastructure projects uh, because that will be the key uh, uh, ecosystem that can enable and also attract investments. And thirdly, we attract private investments. So I think this is one of the key things that we do uh, because private investments uh, the private sectors are actually the one that actually gener uh, playing a key role in, in uh, generating and also uh, sustaining the economic growth uh, in, in any region. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Roberto, you mentioned about the, the evolution of technology, uh, especially in the Northern region. So it started back in the 60s and 70s where the government uh, created or established industrial parks in, in Malaysia. And that has actually attracted a lot of MNCs uh, to, to invest and also <clears throat> grow the economy. So one of the things that we have seen so far, uh, the, the evolution, uh, yes, we have the MNC, but also at the same time, we have seen the growth of the local uh, companies. Uh, right. Previously, there was, they, 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 they were part of the ecosystem uh, in the supply and value chain of the ENE. Uh, sector, but now we have seen a lot of company has grown uh, to become a big players. For example, we can see uh, in Penang, we have uh, Bitrox, we have uh, Siltera and so on. So that have actually shown a lot of uh, potentials 
uh, one of the things that actually have enabled that is through having the right talent, uh, the people that, have, that actually, uh, you know, uh, work towards getting all those skills, uh, the ecosystem, the uh, and also the, the infrastructure and so on. So here in NCR, we focus on developing the ecosystem, attracting the private investments, and ensuring you have a sufficient talent to, to meet the industry demand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hazri. I think that what you mentioned probably is the ambition of most places in the globe. When you attract investment, the ambition is to a point where you will be able also to to nerd, to have local companies starting to emerge, right? So we'll, yeah. we, we'll be back to that. Yeah. Professor Dukidis, um, you and I also had a prep call talking a bit the diverse, um, the, let's say how diverse the economy uh, is in, ac across regions in Greece, but also the, let's say some patterns that can be identified. Um, You've been driving, working to advance entrepreneurship in, in the country. So wh what is your take on what's needed to advance place-based innovation, to make innovation advance on the ground, and how that connects with national competitors in your perspective? Okay. Uh, thank you, Roberto, Deborah, and Simos for your uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, very strong panel and looking forward for the conference in Athens. Uh, as a university professor, I believe that local universities can play a very important role in advancing place-based innovation. In Greece, uh, we have main criticism to the universities because uh, we have 25 universities, 440 departments, which are scattered in 42 different towns. So there was a lot of criticism how these university departments can contribute to the local economy. And for many years, that was the case. There was no contribution. However, in the last 10 years, we see at least 12 cases where actually these university departments actually have very close links with the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. And the reasons are the following. First of all, we see exploitation of research, spin-offs, startups coming out from universities. The, the University of Crete is such an example. Uh, second um, is utilizing high quality graduates. For example, Mr. Burla, the famous CEO of Pfizer, who comes from Thessaloniki, four years ago, because he graduated from the University of Thessaloniki, knew the high quality uh, STEM graduates from that university. So he decided to establish in Thessaloniki the largest international data analytics center of Pfizer. Now, following that, after four years, Thessaloniki is now an international center of data analytics centers of 10 other multinationals, including Deutsche Telekom, including Cisco, all big four consulting companies. So that is an issue. And another point is how open are the university professors using their expertise from university labs in order to offer high quality services to the local entrepreneurs. So these three, if combined, and we give um, the ability to collaborate with open-minded leaders like Mr. Papastergio, then we have win-win cases. Now, going back to the second part of your question, um, uh, how, for example, those can be part of a national policy, um, let me think of some uh, good things that the Greek government actually did in the last few years. First of all, exploitation of diaspora. You know that in Greece, we have 10 million Greeks living in Greece, and we have 5 million living outside Greece. Because we talked about the startup community, uh, in 2021, the local startup community raised $1 billion. However, the startupers, Greeks of diaspora, raised $7 billion. So these people from diaspora 
have big power and now we have special incentives of those coming back to their town of origin and helping the local community. Uh, that's one thing. The second is to promote complementarity of development activities. For the first time in Greece three years ago, the government announced and said, look, this new green energy sector that I'm going to develop is going to be only in that region of Kozani. And why Kozani? Because Kozani had all the lignite mines that actually now are closed. So we have focus and complementarity of those development activities. Now, for example, we're going to develop an international um, innovation center of green shipping. You know that shipping in Greece is very important. We're number one uh, power in Europe and number two globally, and that will be in Piraeus Island. It's like the example that Deborah mentioned earlier. Uh, the other thing that uh, the government is doing is to focus on exporting high quality local products and establishing global brands. I'll give you an example. In the um, west part of Macedonia, in Greece, we have the largest repository of white marble. The Thassos marble is the global brand of any white marble used everywhere in the world. And around that product, we have at least 22 export-oriented companies in two small towns. So it's how you take a local product and you develop a global brand. And uh, last but not least, I think, and this is what it was mentioned also by Mr. Papastergio, if you want to develop a place-based innovation, you have to develop ecosystems of entrepreneurship. So you need a local university, you need high quality suppliers and services, you need good infrastructure, but also access, access to the place. That's why those 12 places that I mentioned in Greece are next to international airports. This is another thing. For example, it's not well known, but Greece has the highest number of international, uh, international airports in Europe. Okay. We have beautiful islands that all of them have international airports plus a university. So can you imagine if we start promoting this? For example, last month, we started promoting Crete, not as a tourist promotion, but as a place to work. It has three international airports, two universities, and a research center, which is ranked number four in Europe. So can you attract scientific nomads or digital nomads? So these are new policies that we have to take into account when actually we think about place-based innovation. Thank you so much, uh, Georgius. I think uh, you, you mentioned this need to act on different levels, right? You need to work to weave the innovation, the whole system at the local level, the ecosystem, but you also need national frameworks where I think connects very well with what Hazari has said. So, and that, that implies in making choices, right? Choosing priorities, but also understanding the assets that you have on the ground, I think, as the mayor is kicking off our conversation, highlighting. Um, we'll be back to that. There are a few things I want to explore. But Saurabh, I want to turn to you. Professor Dukidis talked about universities as fundamental infrastructures to advance innovation, to advance economic development. Today, you, you are part of a university system. You, you've been in business, you've been in investment, different, let's say, different sectors, different uh, places, right? So how do you see this nexus connecting universities, the place, and value creation in different parts of the globe? They said, we, we are, say, Texas A&M is present in, in Europe, has an important presence in Qatar, and for sure, the U.S., so what's your take on how that happens with different flavors in different parts of the globe? Absolutely. Thank you, Roberto, Deborah. This is absolutely a fantastic panel. And Dr. Dukidis, you really set up the 
platform because Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station and Texas A&M University System, uh, we certainly are a place where knowledge is created. Fine, that's where universities are built upon. But one of the things which is shifting now, universities are seen as an engine for local, statewide, national, and global growth. So it's not just anymore doing research for the sake of knowledge. It's absolutely true. But we are now seen as a place where graduates are coming out. They are employable. They can go out and work in the industry. You can create startup companies. And we are mostly trying to solve very difficult problems. We are not solving incremental problems. We are solving problems in the field of energy transition, infrastructure, national security. You know, you think of these things, these are not problems you can solve with one or two engineers or just even one city or state. So from a Texas A&M standpoint, we are responding on one hand to the national policy. So in the United States, you can see National Science Foundation. One word, if you keep on hearing from them, is innovation ecosystem. So NSF has made it very clear now that we are not only solving problems at very deep technical level, but we have to also see how that technology can quickly transition from labs to industry and beyond. So that's our national mandate where we are working. Secondly, what we are seeing now that we can do fantastic science, but none of that will succeed if we are not doing number one workforce development. In the United States, you can see that's one of the biggest challenge, and I think globally too, that we just don't have the workforce which is trained to respond as the technology is being implemented. And third is this innovation, that how we can quickly create the startups with scale. So we are trying to respond to these challenges by seeing how we can, number one, partner globally. And this partnership is a true partnership. We are not talking about just opening some kind of a center or a branch. What we are talking is how we can work at a country level. So for example, we have very deep roots now in Europe, certainly in Greece. We have Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, you know, our biggest partner. Uh, using that as an example, we have multi-level partnerships. So we certainly at the research level, we are working on materials, multiple different uh, areas in the field of metallurgy, mechanics, and those areas. But at the same point, I've been personally involved in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, the incubators, how the students who are doing the summer schools funded by National Science Foundation, who are doing the summer school in Greece, can now take the ideas through that summer school for a startup in Greece. So that's the kind of level at which we are trying to think. And we are just not asking as an abstract or a paper, because that will happen. As a researcher, that's an output point. But when we are looking at it from a standpoint of impact, we are trying to see that can we take it from that summer school to a startup company? Can we bring in a larger company which has deep roots in computational mechanics, take those things and utilize in the designing of the systems? So that's kind of an approach we are taking. So in Greece, we are very deeply embedded uh, with multiple universities, the industry consortiums, uh, we are doing that in France with NSAM. We now have a presence in France. We are working on not only single research projects, but multiple research projects where startups have come out. So for example, we have joint research projects leading to startup companies now. We are raising, fund, uh, raising funds from Asia. So these companies are going global. So what we are trying to do here is, again, what Dr. Dukutis put it in a very nice way, we're trying to build these innovation ecosystems where advanced R&D, workforce, and innovation ecosystems are all connected. Uh, same thing we're trying to do in Qatar when we are talking Middle East. Energy is certainly the focus there. Uh, we are trying to see how we can, you know, in problems of carbon capture, can go and build certain things in a way where not only the research is happening, we are training graduates, we are doing deep tech ecosystem development and connecting it to the local public policy. So from a Texas A&M standpoint, our goal is to see we respond to certainly National Science Foundation, DOD, and locally we are bringing biomanufacturing, advanced defense, hypersonics, and these things in Texas at College Station. Globally, we are trying to see as we partner on energy transition, infrastructure, these areas, we're trying to do the same things by taking advantage and learning from the local ecosystems and building this connectivity so that there is this seamless transition so that these startup companies in Greece can come to US. So it is happening now. They're coming to Texas A&M. They're winning competitions. They're setting up company in US, which is fundraising. And, is, and diaspora is a big thing. In Austin, I know examples where, you know, folks who have moved from Greece long time back, they are funding the startups move from Greece. So this is an amazing connectivity that is happening now 
which is something just not anymore a case study. I can see a lot of these things are playing out day to day. So it's a very relevant topic. And so place-based innovation from a city, state, national, and global level, we're seeing this vertical integration happening quite well. And just our last point in Malaysia, we had our largest turbo missionary meeting in Malaysia, which is the biggest in the world. And we had then Kuala Lumpur, and we had, I think, close to in post-COVID, over 1,000 companies from all of Asia coming to Kuala Lumpur. And that is, an, again, an example of local economic development collaboration that happened to Petronas and all. And we are going back again next year. So what we are talking is a very deep networked global partnerships that we are forming. So, Thank you, Sarab. So impact mentality is my first takeaway uh, from what he said. And the second one is this nexus connecting local, nation and global and how you, you you can potentialize and maybe even leverage some capabilities and 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 results based on that mayor i want to go back to you we have around 20 minutes so let's try really to make this a dynamic conversation everybody if you are watching please feel free to share your questions we already got two questions but mayor how, how do you do that on the ground you mentioned new programs yeah, you talked about for sure understanding the assets that you have in hand, but for instance, you mentioned autonomous vehicles. So, uh, how do you do that to to advance in all those fronts to make the to make the choices? How did how did you get it started, and what what's the recommendation for maybe other cities and places in the world that want to endeavor a similar path? Uh, as I told you, the first thing I would mention or would give an advice is to have a very open mind and ears and listen to the real needs of your society. The second is to have the vision. Uh, after you have uh, got all uh, the inputs and uh, you start building your vision, uh, you have to spread this vision to your community. Uh, mainly in Greece, uh, those years, it was very difficult to find the funding for our project, but I to, every day see my city as a puzzle where there are some uh, let's say pieces. Day by day, we're putting the pieces at the right place. Sometimes there are missing pieces, but uh, every day we discover new funding opportunities. For example, uh, the Resilient and Recovery Fund that now is running uh, in Greece and Europe is, uh, I suppose, uh, the, the only and the last chance we have to make a real uh, sustainable cities. And uh, we also have to have in mind that uh, there be two signs uh, in front of all our initiatives and projects. The first, for sure, is the growth. For example, I'm always saying that it is very important for my citizens to walk on uh, safe and beautiful sideways, uh, but uh, it is more important the people that are walking to the sideways of my city will have a well-paid job. The second is the green sign. We are discussing about sustainability. There is no development and growth without sustainability. The United Nations, we all know that, have uh, uh, released the 70 uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. It would be a very good idea for all our cities to start counting, to have a benchmarking as far as uh, the report, the goal uh, we can obtain for every one of these SDGs. So, uh, yes, I, I believe that the vision and uh, the discussion with the community are the two secrets that we all for sure have to follow. You, you, you talked about playing my words, playing legal, right? Finding the right pieces of the puzzle and putting them together. You need a team to do that, right? So how do you build the capabilities and the capacity within the government structure to play, to play that game? Uh, it is very difficult to find a team, especially in uh, places like uh, my city, which is a, a small a small city. Uh, uh, as I said the word in the beginning about passion. You have to have passion and to find passion people uh, to follow. The problem, for example, for my city is something that Mr. Vukidis said about the universities around Greece. Uh, it is a real fortune for a local uh, community to have a university because, as uh, Sarab said, there is an ecosystem that is building, a very essential ecosystem that will help us. And my only fear is what will happen after, let's say, 10 years. Uh, so the team 
uh, has to be done, has to be made, and also uh, we have to think that uh, being involved with uh, uh, the local community is not a race of speed, it's a race of endurance. So the team uh, is also a very crucial sector of uh, the development of the success of a local, of a local community. Thank you. Um, Professor Dukidis, uh, you, I think what you mentioned, it, it's amazing. This shift that happened, you said around 10 years ago, right, in some way, that today you have 12 universities that are really engaging with the community, more innovation-driven, tech commercialization, etc. What has happened and what could we learn from that that maybe we could replicate in other parts of the globe? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a very tricky question because I I in Greece, we actually, the university system was um, in some ways quite negative to entrepreneurship. However, don't forget that uh, we passed through a huge economic crisis from 2010 to 2019 for 10 years. And that economic crisis actually changed a lot the way we see things. So, um, for example, in the business school, uh, let me give you how business schools have changed. For almost 50 years, we were teaching managers. Now, for the last 15 years, we teach entrepreneurs. It's totally different ballgame. It's mm. very different to teaching entrepreneurs than managers. So that helped. For example, in my business school, we start teaching that from 2000, 2002. Now we have 20 university professors who actually focus on the entrepreneurship. So one change was uh, from the university environment. The other change was from the government. Currently, the Hellenic Development Bank of Innovation, or of investment, is investing some $2 billion uh, to help funds that will actually fund startups in the early stages. That was not the case earlier. And also the government passed a legislation three months ago that uh, actually opens a lot and simplifies the way that a researcher or university professor actually can do a spin-off, can do a startup, because we have a lot of bureaucracy. Also, I would like to add something that Shara uh, said about graduates. You know, in Greece, uh, we have something like 60,000 graduates from universities every year, some 5,000 coming from abroad. Now, 40% of those graduates are overqualified and 20% are unemployed. So that was an asset that actually the local uh, uh, business community could not really match. However, in the last five years, we had 160 international companies who actually find out about this untapped asset and came to Greece and gave something like 35,000 new jobs. So uh, we need also to match what actually the industry likes, the local industry, but the global, because now things are very global. So we have attracted 160 international companies doing their new development center in Greece because we had the right graduates. So it's a combination of actually uh, having close links with the local community because most of those companies are small business, but also preparing um, graduates also for the international field. So amazing, amazing. So, and I think too, I think that Deborah will like this. I think you, you just presented an amazing case about innovating out of crisis. Yeah, something that we've been working on in the GFCC. So, and- Roberto, also, you stole my words. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also how institutional innovation, it's much needed probably across the board in, in, in different nations. So thanks, thanks for raising that. But it also this concept of the untapped potential of assets, the assets that you have in hand. And I want to use this to maybe to turn to you, Hasri. So you mentioned, uh, I want to ask you, how do you identify the opportunities and the priorities 
foreign investments and skills and infrastructure, for instance, that you mentioned in the region in order really to advance the local economy and innovation? Uh, I think I think one of the greatest asset that uh, the NCR has uh, is basically one in terms of infrastructure, uh, connectivity, uh, and so on. I think one of another, another key thing is also talent, the the people that we have uh, because of the evolution in in, in the ENE industry. So that have actually uh, uplift uh, in terms of the skills and capability of uh, the talents in the northern region. I just want to share with you one of the things that. Uh, we, we do in, in how we, we uh, enhance this. Uh, we, we have actually created a platform where uh, the government, the uh, private sector, as well as the uh, academia, so the universities actually sit together in, in a platform to, uh, to encourage innovation and R&D projects. So this is where we, you can see uh, companies actually come together, even though in, 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 in reality, they are actually uh, competitors, but in terms of uplifting and also advancing uh, the R&D capability for the region, they will come together, uh, sit down, discuss, and come up with projects, innovation and R&D projects. So one of the key things that um, the outcome that we have uh, achieved is um, additional investments, about $2 billion uh, coming from this project alone. So uh, using this technology that have been uh, created by this platform. So now what we have, uh, we, we, what, what we will be doing is how we can actually uplift the uh, small and medium companies. So uh, in terms of uh, the platform is mainly comprised of big companies, the multinationals like Intel, uh, AMD and so on. But now we want to share those uh, innovation and also technology to the SMEs. So this is where the government comes in and help those uh, local small companies to actually have access to the technology that uh, you know uh, being created or being discussed at, at uh, MNCs. And, and, and lastly, I would like to also share how we also involve the community uh, in, 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 uh, in innovation. So even though it's kind of a very small scale projects, but uh, together with the universities, uh, the private sector, as well as the community. So we come up with small uh, innovation projects at the local level. So that can actually uh, help uh, the community to, to be sustainable, use that, that technology, uh, the ideas to, 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 to earn more income and uh, improve in terms of their, their economy, local economy. So that is local. So as you can see, we, we have a holistic uh, approach in terms of you know, uplifting the, the capability for the people. Well, when you say a platform, Hazri, what are you talking about? Real, like a digital platform? Is that like an online um, environment in which different stakeholders go and share ideas? Or what is that? Uh, basically, we uh, arrange... Uh, 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 and we, we have actually created an agency to actually look into uh, collaborative, collaborative arrangement between the private sector uh, and also the university. So that, that kind of platform. So they come uh, to, to, to this uh, program uh, with the support of the government. So they come and, and actually uh, conduct also uh, innovation pro projects and so R&D projects. So the government actually provided some assistance in terms of uh, funding and so on. Okay, so you, yes. you convene <clears throat> those players and you, you serve like the connector, but also you provide resources to identify and develop projects that are relevant right. for right. the region. Got it, yeah. Yes, sir. So Rab, from what you've seen in different parts of the globe, are there any examples that you think we should all know about when we have this conversation about driving local innovation? Um, there are a couple of them, and, you know, we have limited time, but I quickly in terms of local innovation that is happening, we are in College Station, Texas, which is kind of in the middle of the triangle of Austin, Houston, and Dallas. So which is itself, I think eighth largest economy in the world because of the activity going on. But what we have done there is quite amazing in creating a biomanufacturing hub. And which is very unique because when you think of North Carolina and Boston and West Coast, where mostly a lot of this manufacturing has been happening classically, 
it was really driven by some bold initiatives where we thought where things are going in more complicated biologics manufacturing, you needed to bring not only technologies, but we also approached it together with workforce. So why, why we succeeded in that in making a local community, which initially had very little training in that sophisticated manufacturing areas, we not only invested in bringing the technology, we also invested in the workforce development. So the first thing which came was more of training people and that opened up the door for companies to start coming. So it has now become biomanufacturing hub with one of the largest CDMOs like Fujifilm. There are companies from abroad now they are moving in because Texas provides an advantage in terms of cost in real estate and certain things. So now it has become globally competitive, but in a very, very local economy. So the lesson learned from there is you can have a very advanced technology in one place, but unless until you have the workforce that can go and quickly you can turn them on and have them employable, you're not going to succeed and they're going to gravitate to more existing hubs. So we created almost a, we call it third coast of biomanufacturing, which did not even exist 10 years back. And that is happening in a very local environment. So that's an example of what we have done in the US. And in terms of external partnership, again, I go back to what we have done in Greece, where a very fundamental basic science relationship, as deep as in the world of mechanics, we have turned that into a much more vertical integrated partnership now, where we are training students during those summer schools, how to be an entrepreneur, how to take the ideas of a new algorithm or a new design, and you work with the local incubators and start thinking about going forward. And we are kind of seeing that success and trying to replicate that when I'm using example of Qatar or France or in other more, you know, more individual level partnerships in other countries, we're now trying to see that research will always happen between academics, but how we can put these layers of training on entrepreneurship and innovation along with that. So the grad students, postdocs, they not only, you know, we have seen that some of them go to academia, but most of them end up in industry, how we can take some of them and be much more entrepreneurial in their thinking. So these are the two quick examples I can give of a local uh, activity and the global activity. And we are trying to always share best practices and learn from, again, where we go, which is very important because we don't know how to operate in every country in their cultural framework. So that is the other piece uh, that we are utilizing in our you know, activities as we are going forward. So. Amazing. We are approaching the end of our session. So what do we do now? And I, we, we got a few questions. So my idea is maybe just to review those questions and invite all of you for our final lightning round here in which you could address one of those questions or you could, and I would ask you if possible, to give one recommendation to really to folks who are watching and listening to this conversation. How can they in practice advance local-based innovation? So, but as I said, I'll quickly review the questions that we, we had here, right? One, it's about the incentives that universities could give to startups. What are those incentives? And that was directed to you, um, uh, Professor Dukides. The other thing is if any of you would have any thoughts about rural, rural development and how to connect city rural areas and, and have this place-based focus considering the reality of uh, rural uh, places. Yeah. And finally, um, what, what are some of the changes that happen that you see in the thinking about clusters? right, um, from the early 2000s up to now. So does feel free to take those questions. But in this final round, what I wanted to invite you is to reflect on those if possible, but also to give one, one concrete recommendation that you would like to share with our global audience on how they could advance place-based innovation. And Hazri, I, I want to start with you, if that's okay. Yeah, I would like just to uh, comment on the rural development. I think that is very relevant to what we do uh, in, in the northern region of, of Malaysia, where we can see very advanced economy in Penang. But at the same time, we have uh, uh, places where we really lack uh, in terms of uh, capability, economy, and so on. So what we do is a very uh, intensive uh, training and also capability building for the people. 
So uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of skills, uh, so that they can actually uh, uplift in terms of their, 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 their economy and also participate in more advanced and high value uh, economic activities within the region. So we spend a lot of uh, resources and time actually looking at these people, train them, and also get them, uh, move them up uh, to, to the higher value chain. Any other final recommendations, your final tagline, something that you would tell everybody, this is how you want to advance place-based innovation? I think key is collaboration. I, I, I mentioned earlier the collaboration between um, four parties like the government, the private sector, uh, the community, as well as the academia. That's very key. Within the local ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Hazri. Thank you so much yeah. for being It's so late in Malaysia now. It's very, we appreciate a lot having you here. Um, Mayor Papastergiu, so what's, what's your take? What's your recommendation as a leader that has been making change happen on the ground? Uh, the only recommendation I could say is that we have to see our communities, our cities, our municipalities from scratch because uh, maybe advantages of the past are not for sure the ones of today or tomorrow. So as new uh, changes uh, are raised uh, from uh, this new digital era, just to uh, re-engineer our cities, re-engineer our minds, this is my only recommendation. Have look into the future. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. So. The past will, your past success will not guarantee your future success. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Sorab, your, your final comments on any of the questions or just your final recommendation. So quickly on the first question you had in how startups can work with universities, certainly, which has always been a barrier, it is still a barrier. We are talking spin outs from intern universities to outside from outside startups to utilize universities. There is, these are the biggest resources in every country where you have equipments and you know people who are there. So we have tried to make it to simple. Agreements have to be simple. There has to be uh, risk capital involved, but there's a huge opportunity in terms of sharing IP, making IP agreements simpler, making terms transparent so that an entrepreneur from outside can come in and license the technology or they can utilize the billions of dollars of investment in equipments and all instead of trying to scale up those things. So there has to be this impedance mismatch that is existing there go away so that the community can utilize the resources of these universities in the community and not just larger companies out there. And my final recommendation is again, as my theme that we have to integrate advanced R&D, workforce training and innovation ecosystem together. Because unless until these three work together, there will be a challenge on inequity. There's other challenge we have is inequity of talent. You have talent concentrated in some places and then you don't have at all in certain areas. So for local cities to succeed, there has to be this vertical integration of advanced R&D training people who might be of completely different skill set from oil and gas to biotech, but you have to train them to utilize the skill set. And again, going back to the innovation ecosystem, which has to come from federal government, the local venture and angel groups, and certainly the economic development of the city. So that will be my key recommendation. Very important, sir. I mean, I can tell you on a personal note that it resonates a lot to someone like me who come from, I do come from the emerging world. And there are places in which investments were made, including universities. You have infrastructures, but you're not creating the value that you could because you don't have the frameworks to do that. Absolutely. So very, I think it's a fundamental, and I know some of the colleagues who actually asked the question. I imagine that will resonate with them. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Professor Dukidis, what's your take? What's your okay. key take recommendation? An idea that has to do with rural area. We had a question about that. Just a, a, an initiative that Europe is doing, and I'm not sure if other, um, let's say, continents are doing it, uh, to support place-based innovation in rural areas that relate to agriculture, dairy products, and wine products. It's called protected designation of origin. Mm -hmm. uh, these are intellectual property rights 
for specific foods and products, agricultural products, whose qualities are specifically linked to the area of production. And therefore, the production and processing must only take place in the specific region. This is the most important policy of Europe to develop place-based mm -hmm. innovation in rural areas. For example, if something is called Kalamata olive oil, which is the best olive oil globally, it should be produced only in Kalamata. This is very important. Uh, it's used a lot in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Greece. And I don't know if this sort of policy actually can also be transferred to other parts of the, of, of the globe. So this is a recommendation. Amazing, Professor Dukidis. And I think in addition to your fundamental recommendation, you just made a compelling case for colleagues who are watching us to go to Greece in November when we have the Global Innovation Summit to try some of those um, specialty products on the ground uh, there uh, with colleagues from around the globe. Deborah, over to you. Your recommendation, your final thoughts. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me thank our panelists for this incredible, exciting, and learning experience. I took very copious notes here. And I think, Roberto, as we begin to work on developing the 2022 GFCC Global Principles that we will release at the summit on November 15th, they will be linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but the theme will be around place-based innovation. So we've gotten tremendous um, intellectual assets from this discussion and the others to follow before we uh, come to Greece in November. Uh, let me just share a couple overarching thoughts. Um, we, we clearly heard from our Greek colleagues, um, the mayor and professor, the, the power of innovating out of crisis and the real excitement that's underway in, in Greece to create you know, a new economy out of a, of a terrible economic crisis that left the country with huge uh, unemployment, tremendous drop in GDP, et cetera. Um, we also heard about you know, the emergence of the innovation ecosystems and how you build these and knitting together you know, the various players, but also the pivotal role of government at the national, regional, local level. Um, Mayor, I, 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 I love what you said. No one knows our regions better than us. And I think that's a starting point you know, for every uh, region and community working on an innovation future. I also was very struck by how we talked about knitting together some of the cultural issues as well. Um, Mayor, I have to tell you that when we, we come to Greece um, for the summit, after we leave Athens, we're going to have a special trip to Iparos and Yanina, a very interesting part of Greece with a great history, but also you know, very much at the cusp of moving into the 21st century digital and advanced manufacturing company. I hope maybe we could afterwards come by Tricola and maybe that, that Christmas fair will be open by then. But uh, I know that many people will want to come and, and visit Tricola. I for one commit to do that. So I, I will urge others to come as well. Um, the one recommendation that I, I want to share, um, you know, out of this conversation, but also more broadly, is that digital skills and cyber skills today are the equivalent of literacy in the 19th and 20th century. And everyone has to have these assets to participate in an economy that requires this just as a fundamental platform, um, not just access to not how we do our work, how we think autonomy. I mean, all of these things require that. And so I think that's something that all of us that are focused on how do we build the skills and the workforce of the future on which all of this depends, we need to have that as a foundation. And Professor, um, Dukitas, I know that in curriculum, I don't know if in Greece, but certainly in the United States, you know, we treat cybersecurity and, and digital skills almost as a separate category. We don't embed it across everything. And so, you know, to me, cyber is for all, digital is for all. And that is a very fundamental capability for building local to global uh, innovation capacity. Um, I also want to congratulate our colleague from Malaysia. We had the opportunity to, you know, to visit you back in 2017. 
And again, a very, very sophisticated innovation strategy in Malaysia at the federal and local level. And thank you for sharing that. And Super, you have to come to Greece. There's no question. You, we're not going to let you um, not come to the Innovation Summit with your colleague and our friend, Dimitris Lagoudis. You've done an incredible thing in Greece, but also throughout the world and your concepts of vert vertical integration. So finally, um, on the natural, beautiful products of Greece, I hope we're going to showcase some of these at our at our meals in Greece. Um, Mayor, we have to have some of your Cyprin. We have to have some of your feta cheese, and we'll make sure that we have Kalamata oil. Um, and also make sure that we have some of the other uh, really unique, beautiful products of Greece. I, I just wanna urge everyone to come bring colleagues. It's, it's a wonderful time of year. And we're very, very proud at the GFCC to be partnering with Compete Greece and the Delphi Economic Forum and really build a new platform for local to global and place-based innovation. So Roberto, thank you for putting together a great uh, panel for your excellent moderating and um, look forward to seeing everyone in Athens in November. Thank you, Deborah. And a few things before we go. One, a GFCC tradition. We will take a picture here. So please look, open your cameras, look at the camera. And uh, this is something that we always do. And I'm inviting my colleagues, Vanessa, uh, Simone, and Riley, who are um, helping us to execute this yeah so picture taken second thing for all of you who are watching us here today this series will be continued on september the 9th we're having another online session or the 8th vanessa if i maybe i'm, I'm mixing september, 8th. september the 8th so sorry for that and we will talk pri priorities for competitiveness with a highlight on innovation. Third thing, um, please stay tuned for updates on the GFCC Global Innovation Summit. We heard amazing things, and Deborah, you were mentioning the imperative of digital literacy. And I think, um, Mayor, just want to commend you. I think I know that all schools in your city have received robotics kits. You have provided Wi-Fi to thousands of houses in your city. I think as Deborah said, we all across the globe need to be aware of that, of the importance of providing those resources for people to develop their capabilities and skills. So amazing case. And Deborah, um, you were talking and one thing came to my mind, listening to, listening to our colleagues here today, this amazing panel, that people in governance also need some future building literacy. And we had a great example here of leaders who are advancing that. If you were watching this session, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Stay tuned for updates on the GFCC. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Thank you all. <laughs>